Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University and PyTorch. In this video, we're going to take a look at regression neural networks in PyTorch. We'll begin by opening this notebook in Colab. The link to this notebook in GitHub is contained in the description of this video. We'll run the first block. This just sets up so that we have access to the GPU if it's available and defines functions from before, like early stopping, that we are going to make use of. We're going to look at the simple data set that we've seen before. I'll go ahead and open it so that you can see it. It's a CSV file, so strangely, Microsoft always gives a warning on what is probably the most common data format for information transfer. Excel certainly is not the most common format for information exchange. Anyway, we are predicting the age. That is what we are doing for regression. We're going to use all these other values here to try to predict the age. If we were trying to predict one of the categorical values here, product, that's really the only one provided here, then we would be doing a classification. So let's go back to my notebook. We'll go ahead and read it in. This will take a moment. And you'll see that it is creating dummy variables for all the categoricals. We saw how to do this previously. But we're simply creating a dummy column for each one of, of these. So job, and then we delete the original job because we have to get anything out of there that's going to have text in it. And then area and product are also generated for, for dummies. For the income, there are missing values there. So we go ahead and find out the median and fill the missing values with the median. And then we're going to standardize the ranges using z-score. z-score is a very good just general purpose normalizer that gets these values so that they're centered about zero, which does help the neural network. The x is going to be all the columns except for age, because age is what we're trying to predict, and ID. X is what we're trying to, to use to predict the Y, and Y is the H. We'll go ahead and define the regression neural network. You can see a couple of layers here. We have the input count, and then 50 as a hidden. These diagonals always have to match, so 50, 50, 25, 25, or PyTorch will give you an error. And then the output count is simply one. You can do multiple regression, where you're regressing several values. And that's typically done with a autoencoder or, or a, other techniques, plenty of techniques that would use that. The forward pass is where we put in these fully connected layers, one and two, that we defined up here. I commented out the softmax. I'll probably remove that just to clean the code up a little bit. This was just me copying and pasting and taking from a classification problem. There is no activation function on the output of a regression neural network. Then we split into training and test. We convert to torch tensors. And then we convert them to the appropriate device if we're using the GPU, for example. We're going to use a batch size of 16 which means that 16 data elements will pass before we update the weights of the neural network. An epoch is still one entire pass over the data set. We construct the neural network. We're going to use mean squared error as the loss. That's essentially the difference between what we expected it to be and what the neural network actually output. Squared, which acts as a absolute value. We, we just care that we differed by amount. We don't care if that amount was positive or negative. We're going to use the Atom Optimizer, which is a very common optimizer to use for this, and we're going to use Early Stopping. So now we're going to loop over the batches, and as we get the batches, we are going to present them to the neural network. We're going to calculate the loss. And for each batch, we're going to zero these gradients because we're collecting the errors and then we'll ultimately update 
the weights. We'll calculate the loss and we'll determine if it's time to evaluate the neural network with the test. We don't want to just evaluate the test every single time because that does take a, a, an amount of processing time. This loop is very common. You'll see this many, many times as we go through this course. Higher level frameworks like TensorFlow and Keras, for example, they just put this whole thing into a function that they give you called fit, which is good because there's less stuff to put in, but bad because you really can't customize it as easily. So it trains, and I didn't actually run that, so let's let it go ahead and train. I'll fast forward through this. You can see the early stopping is still at zero. Once we start to get some unproductive epochs, this will start to increase of one of five, two, three, and then eventually when it hits five, it will stop. All right, it counted up one, two, three, four, five. So those were five epochs where the validation error did not increase. We're gonna report some of the error metrics. So we're going to calculate the mean squared error. The mean squared error is not too useful for comparing things. It's great for the neural network optimizer because as it decreases, good things are happening, so it tries to minimize this. It's essentially the difference between what you predicted, which is the y hat, and then the, the actual y squared, which effectively is an absolute value. And we sum those all up and then divide by the size of the data set. So we're effectively taking an average. The problem with mean square error is there's no real units to it. When we get back that the mean square error is 0 0.621, we don't really know what that means. We just know that we would like it to be smaller. If you take the square root of it, now you have your actual units and you can know that for those ages, we were about 0 0.77 or so off from it of, of a year. We also like to calculate a lift chart. This is what the lift chart looks like. I'll go ahead and run it to generate it. This is a pretty good looking lift chart. You can see the blue is usually completely underneath of the orange. The blue is the expected values with all the values sorted from left to right, from lowest to highest at the, at the right. And then the prediction. So the prediction should lay on top of it pretty closely. You will see highs and lows as it makes bad predictions, but in general, this is what a good lift chart would look like. Thank you for watching this video. And if you would like to see more of this course, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and click the like if this was helpful to you.